All right, welcome to meat cutting day two. Let's get to it. Steroids and hormones, everyone's favorite things, getting bigger and stronger, used for the same reason in animals. Um, what we know about hormones and is that they're chemicals that naturally are produced in animals. Um, they Im they control important body functions, specifically growth, development, and reproduction. In animals, what that does is we know this, it makes them gain weight more quickly and increases milk production substantially. What we're doing is we're looking at naturally occurring hormones, specifically estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Uh, we're also looking at synthetic, so we're looking at how these are made or how the body makes them, and then we are through scientific means creating their genetic modified synthetic. So, tenbolone acetate, which is testosterone, not a Ferrari car, not the testosterone, not, not, not anything like that. Xeranol, which is the uh, byproduct of or synthetic version of estrogen, and melogestrel acetate, it just sounds fun to say, progesterone. Um, so now we have learned to scientifically create these naturally occurring her hormones. What it's doing is, in the, in, in, the U in the European Union, scientists have proven that the use of hormones in food causes problems. Oddly enough, in the United States, we have not followed suit with that. We don't necessarily believe that that's true. The primary th reason that we don't believe that that's true is because who do you think is going to profit from the distribution of those things? Who's going to profit is drug companies. When the drug companies profit, then the government gets taxes and everyone win-wins, except for the people that are consuming the byproduct of that meat that has been treated with steroids and hormones. So, they've been suspect to increasing cancer. Uh, we've seen an early onset of puberty in females, specifically in grade school where students who are eating public school systems are exposed to tremendous amounts of steroids and ho hormones. Um, the primary reason that they're getting them is because of the fruits and vegetables that they're eating. It also increases diabetes and hypothyroidism. Nice pretty cow. That's a Holstein Friesian, a milker. You see those a lot in Vermont and you also see it on Ben and Jerry's. Another common hormone that is used is RBGH recombinant bovine growth hormone. What this does is it stimulates lactation in dairy cattle by upwards of 40%. Now anytime, imagine we are doing race cars. Anytime we do a race car or we create a race car and we drive that race car and we push it as hard as we can all the time, what do you think happens to it? The car falls apart. So as a result of what's happening by increasing the stimulate or stimulating the lactation in these animals is we are essentially increasing the mortality rate or the rate in which they die. They're dying at younger ages. It's also found to cause cancer by a panel of scientists in Canada. When you look at the actual name, recombinant actually is the byproduct of this implementation. Recombinant means a splicing or a reproduction on a genetic level of cells and that's essentially what cancer is. So when you're looking at your milk Look for it to see, say RBGH free, and now you actually know what that is. It's not good. It's bad stuff. Another cool thing that's done to our meat, <coughs> which is kind of on the down low, is radiation or irradiation. Uh, and it's noted by this beautiful little kind of picturesque thing. When you look at that, you wouldn't suspect that anything's wrong with it, right? It's a package of meat. And we all know that package, that meat actually comes on a styrofoam platter wrapped in plastic. It doesn't actually come from an animal. Um, so when you see this angelic looking symbol, you're thinking, oh, it's nice. It must have been carried here by angels or floated here on the, on the breath of uh, amazing people. However, what's happening is it's being treated with radiation. Three specific rays of radiation, soft X-rays, gamma X-rays, and cathode rays. Um, and when you look at this setup, this is a, a picture of a, a standard radiation facility. Um, what's happening here is you can see that the meat goes in one side, goes down a chute, goes through the process, blah, 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 comes out the other side. See all the people in here? Oh, wait, there are no people. That's weird. Why would we have people where the radiation is going to go, but we're going to treat the meat with radiation, ship it out here, and shoot it to the consumers because it has this cool symbol on it that means that it's good. What's happening when the meat is irradiated is it's altering the interior of the cell. It's taking a, a positively 
charged ion and turning it into a negatively charged ion and vice versa. Basically all you're doing is rearranging the interior. It doesn't kill bacteria and it doesn't um, increase the uh, prevention of bacterial growth. Um, again, who's getting a cut from this? Well, it's a controlled substance, so the government's going to get a, a cut of how we are using that. Um, it's a federally inspected product, so again, we have to get it from there, so um, watch out. Be weary of radiated meats. Now we go into aging. There's two primary uh, ways of aging, and actually in the book they talk about another method called fast aging. Uh, we're not really going to talk about that. Um, it's a method that's kind of up and coming, but the two traditional methods are dry and wet aging. Dry aging was the traditional means of aging the meat, uh, and what they would do was they would hang it from the gambrel cord, which is your Achilles tendon, and you can see this here. This is the animal actually upside down. So this is the back leg, this is the hiney, um, and the head would be down here, just to give you a perspective of where that is. So the gambrel cord in the old days, old school, they would hang it up from the gambrel cord, generally in a tree in the fall, and they would wait until that gambrel cord. And that gambrel cord on a beef animal is about an inch to two inches thick. When that gambrel cord rotted out, then they knew the meat was ready to eat. And what was happening is the meat was utilizing the natural lash acid that's present in the muscle. Uh, and what it does is it slowly denatures the protein strand and increases or enhances the characteristics of the meat, making it incredibly delicious. Delicious town, we'll say. Dry aging. When you look at dry aging, it's kind of a, a pretty looking thing. Um, it has a, it's a, basically a race with rot, um, and it smells a lot like a morgue um, because it's dead meat, um, but it has a, a sweet caramelized sugar smell for some reason, um, but it is incredible. What you can see here is the meat is entering here, so this is the newest meat, and then it's going to go up, and it's going to rotate around here, so this is the meat that's ready for distribution. The reason they dry age it like this is because this meat up here is actually enhancing the flavor of this meat down here. Very similar to the way that uh, someone who ages, ages cheese would age in a cave to get that nice characteristic flavor. Um, it releases moisture, and that's where it gets the name dry aging because you are releasing moisture from the lactic acid actually digesting the protein. It needs to escape the meat, and that helps to promote the dry aging process. Now, a considerable amount of liquid is lost um, in upwards of 28%. The primary reason that you want to leave the bone on and leave the fat cap on is because the bone, much like when you roast a piece of meat on a bone, is going to reduce shrinkage. It's also going to enhance flavor. That fat acts as a semi-permeable surface that allows air in and moisture out. And if any bacteria gets in there, it gets on the edges. So you're going to have to trim that off. You're going to have to take the bones off. You're going to have to take the fat off. Traditionally, it was done with full sides of beef, uh, and the French was a method called mortification. They'd hang the animal by the gambrel cord until it broke. Today, dry aging is really reserved for more expensive cuts of meat. Wet aging, or vacuum-packed aging, was developed as a, a, a cry from the market to increase distribution, to get more meat into the market more quickly. Now, when you look at this, you can see it's a very standardized size. It's a heavy-duty box. Anyone who's opened up the box, you can see it's... it's uh, fortified so that it's stronger, but anyone who has moved a box of beef or who has stacked a box of beef knows that it's heavy, um, but it also is much easier for distribution. Let's imagine that we're looking at the back of a, an 18-wheeler, and let's imagine these are the walls. So here's the floor, tires would be down here. You open up the back, think back a couple slides to that side of beef, and imagine it's hanging from the top of the trailer up here, and it's dangling down on the ground. Now anyone who has moved and packed knows that didn't ever it never t no it, it never fails that if you get the biggest truck available you're still not going to be able to get all your crap in it so same thing is true here imagine we're get this this back of a trailer the animals hanging down and you can think about all those tiny spaces I could put a lamp here I could put some books over here I could put my brother over here whatever but you're thinking about how to utilize that space most effectively the reason that boxed or wet aging was developed was because it increases distribution substantially because it allows for greater flexibility in shipping. So they started to break the animals down from sides to primals. They would cry back the primals, pop them into boxes, and shoot it out. Sometimes you'll hear this process of wet aging also called modified atmospheric packaging. 
the art and science of marinades. There are two basic styles or methods of using marinades to tenderize meat and add flavor. The two are acidic and enzymatic. Meat texture is composed primarily of two types of toughness. So what that means is we're looking at why we are adding a marinade and what do we want to get in the long run. We're primarily looking at the me mechanical resistance of the myofibrillar structure. And you're thinking, what the hell is he talking about, right? So what you're thinking about is how developed is that actual protein strand. In an older animal, it's going to be more developed. It's going to be tougher. In a younger animal, it's going to be less tough and less developed. You're also going to look at the connective tissue content. And that's going to be primarily noted from where the primal came from. Enzymatic tenderization is what we're going to talk about first. It's actually digesting the enzymes, um, and they are stimulating chemical ch uh, changes in other substances. The three classes of digestive enzymes are enzymatic, uh, sorry, proteolytic enzymes, which digest protein. And you're thinking, wow, it's crazy. It has pictures of fruit and meat cutting. But it actually, the proteolytic enzymes come from fruit. Bromelain comes from pineapple. Pap papain comes from papayas. Phycine comes from figs, and actinidin, this is actually kiwis, I know it's hard to see, comes from kiwis. The juice must be fresh. Um, when it's canned, it changes the, the proteolytic enzyme content, and it's not as effective. Lipases digest fat, and amylases digest carbohydrates. When we're looking at acidic tenderization, we're actually denaturing the protein strand. So imagine this is a protein strand, and when we add the acid to it, it actually cuts this strand into tiny little pieces. Now everyone's had a piece of rope and at the end it's a frayed knot. So when we cut that protein strand, which is essentially what the acidic tenderization is doing, is it's cutting this into small pieces. So that instead of getting two ends that are fluffy, now every section with that protein strand is going to become fluffy. And that's what this is down here, the fluff factor. Okay? So we go from original protein strand, application of acid, it's going to make it fluffy. That fluffy, the fluffy bits on the end, is where flavor is going to be absorbed. Now, you can over acidify something in a marinade, and it just basically cooks it and removes all the moisture, and that's what you want to avoid. Different kinds of acidic tenderization. You're going to have acetic acid, which are found in vinegars of wine, citric acid, which oddly enough comes from citrus, and lactic acid, which comes from buttermilk and yogurt. Uh, sorry, it's just, just a different spelling, old school spelling of yogurt. Um, don't hate me because I spell differently. Um, lactic acid actually is going to denature the protein. We talked about that in dry aging. It's going to denature the protein and it's going to change the characteristic of the meat. Um, it also takes really strongly flavored meat and makes it not so strong. And there we have it, the end of day two's lecture. Have fun. Hammer it.